everyone. My name is Dr. Ann Barngrover. I'm a faculty member here at St. Leo and I teach English um, both for graduates and undergraduates. Um, thank you for listening to this reading. I wish we could all be there in person, um, but at least we get to share some writing with you all um, in this uh, different way. Um, so I'm going to be reading a few poems um, from my latest poetry collection uh, in progress. And these poems are persona poems, meaning that they're in the voice of someone else, another character. Um, and they're in the voice of the Roman goddess Ceres. Um, she is the equivalent of the Greek goddess Demeter, who, uh, if you know something about Greek myths, um, she was the mother of Persephone, who was taken by Hades to the underworld. Um, and Ceres was the uh, goddess of agriculture, of women and girls, and also randomly cereal grains. Um, so she was revered by people at the time for being connected to the earth, fertility, uh, womankind, and um, just the environment. So I kind of came across her in mythology a few years ago, sort of by accident, but I started to wonder, like, what would she be thinking of the way that we have treated this planet? Um, and, you know, how would she react if we kind of plopped her down right now in the 21st century as we're going through uh, the anthrop Anthropocene and sort of the sixth mass um, extinction and climate crisis? Um, you know, would she feel betrayed? Would she feel angry? Would she feel sad? Um, so these poems are all in her voice um, as imagined um, in today's society. Um, and I'll just, I'll just read through them. Um, so this one is called Series in the Uncreation. I tried to write a warning in chaste trees and pumpkin vines. The worst men of our lives will return to us in more ways than one. Preordained how women must watch this reincarnation of cursed stone. The curdled constellations of anger and loneliness you men rewrite and call myths of heroes. Call yourselves heroes. Don't you ever learn? I am the goddess of law and order. I am the goddess of food plants and cereal grain. Without agriculture, your precious banknote civilization collapses into slag, your precious small farms. You treat them how you treat your women, admonished husks, abhorrent wards. I am the guardian of women and girls in their times of transition, the points when they're most vulnerable, which means at all times, which means I cannot protect them. My name translates to grow. Did you know I was chained? From him, I birthed another daughter along with the child of a horse. You want to say, I did this to myself. If I had not lived in this body, if I had not run, was it a son? Even the goddess of vessels becomes a vessel. The summers you created broil your crops and your cities. You'll fight long wars over water that evaporates into smoke. Perhaps you have forgotten your stars were never undying. The fates are women also. Series in the Red Tide. And if you're a Floridian or have lived in Florida, you know uh, what red tide is, especially um, how bad it was a few years ago down in like Sarasota area, um, more specifically. Uh, series in the Red Tide. The ocean wretches and collects. We have mistaken you, our water god, for a savior of fallow pastures, your ruling planet for a fixed star. A message blinks through the ether. Let's work on improving this together. 
but it's too late for prayers when salt animals distend heavy as a sodden paperback, toxic script pen on every folio. They cannot hide in their septic shells, and you cannot return the light energy you harnessed from the sun. Don't you remember? I tried to run from you with hooves and quick reacting tendons. I transformed myself into a mare. Neptune, brother, you would not rest until you overpowered everything that needed glue to breathe. You plunged your own house into the great dark. You sealed our throats with rocks. Haven't you always proved the impossible equation, never seen with the naked eye, discovered only through ancient math? I could not escape from you by horse or will or sheath of grain. The ocean remembers, the planets remember, my body remembers everything you've done. Series in the Global Heat Wave. Have you ever tried to sleep as wind thrash a lofted room the way a god of evil flogs a wooden ship at sea? You feel very small. If it weren't for cliff gusts and morning fog, we'd perish like snails do on this dark and dry land. They've been trying to live since the era when islands weren't yet islands, but a part of Seedling's collective dream, white and spiral. I am not from any country or generation. This doesn't take place anywhere in particular, except for now maps look like they're screaming. Too hot for ruins, too hot for roads. Bake popcorn butter flowers on real cobs. Butter's gloss undermines the ruse as if we required hyperbole to prove what went wrong. I'm rubbing the apocalypse in your face, I guess, since I don't get to be moody otherwise. If men are mad at me, they hurt me or they leave with the blue stoneware of my heart, and I never uncover it again. Tonight, I'm the hottest I've ever been. I figure if that star doesn't move by the next time I look up at the sky, it must be real. Art needs an artist, words need a writer, and stars need to be believed. But what can I say about faith when I've given the last of my warnings? I loved you in the marginal seas and those not defined by currents. I loved you with salt on my lips and in small sounds too numerous to list aloud. I've been trying to live since the era of your silence, which fills with trapped air like a gas that goes on and on. And I'll never be emotionally detached for you to take me seriously. I can't save every slug on ash and asphalt, but I'll touch their damp bodies with hands not clean enough to hold. Too hot tonight for rain, too hot for eyes to close. I lie awake all night listening as you take the world from me, little by little, then all at once. Series in the Field of Bones. Be real with me for once and answer. So one season of destruction is not enough for you. I'm not sorry I was never drawn to you like I was drawn to the high sea. Somewhere along the way, I developed an internal ocean. Underwater, there's still agriculture. I can swim deeper than darkness goes. When you took my love from me, I could not bear to look at flowers anymore. Accounts vary. Stories unstitched to make me smaller, but I remember what I wanted. To slash at the root, to rend my nails bloody in the dirt until I found you. How do you kill an undead god? Raise the barren strawberry, colt's foot, wine cup, the cut and come again. 
In the trees, magnolia petals perch like swan napkins, cream. They brown sweetly as banana peels. Tear them in fistfuls from their branches. I can't stand you seeing colors when all I see is wind and brine tide pools. No starfish, nothing to point at that's mine. If you must spare the poppy, orange sick and lustful, then break a record of spring rainfall, a super bloom we can view from space. May the fields flow like daughters before you poison them all. Theories in the cyber apocalypse. At the end of the world, there was always going to be a woman alone and digitally vulnerable, shucked like drought corn, squalid as hair. All I have ever asked for was a pig and the other pig inside her, born only in dream time. You thought I wanted them slaughtered? How like a man to see limitations for blood. Believing you have power will get you so far. You steal my money by vowing you'll keep it safe. Cradle my passwords as if they were white fuzz caterpillars tumbling from your arms. Hold hostage photographs of my naked breasts and the places where I'm hinged. Fine, show it all, take it all. What do you think I've kept for myself? Spelt wheat falls from my open palms. I only have bread and a daughter, bread and a daughter to give you. Don't you know I can't leave her even if I'm halved and scooped of seeds, faint as insect wings? I emerge from the earth like a plant and I will depart like a plant if you force me to. Bloodless, Voiceless, how my body weighs heavy as a riverbed in the dry loam. My final exhale rises. I become the air you breathe. And this is the last one. Series in the environmental personhood. Listen, I don't want to leave my job. I just want an apology because it's not my fault that you were made stupid by the fear of blasphemy which is really your own need for control over others' minds. A person cannot be owned, so therefore neither can a river, neither forest nor field. All living systems share a common destiny, indivisible and whole from the mountains to the sea, the right to exist, to persist, to maintain and regenerate their vital cycles. A goddess belongs to herself which is to say, I don't belong to your environment or your economy. If I choose my shipwrecked existence, my dark walled home. Here is the world's greatest secret. My daughter lives in art and summer and golden leaves. I have no daughter or I have everyone. She is the personification of vegetation. I am the mother of the goddess of death, savior maiden, bringer of fruit, child of bread. Here is the greater secret no one wants you to know. She went willingly in search of her own depth and power. That means I must go too. Uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, I hope you enjoy the other faculty's readings as well, and uh, have a good rest of your night. Bye. Hi, I'm Pat Crearand, and I'm going to read a short story for you. It's new. It, it's called Vesuvius, and there's really not much you need to know other than the title. Okay, um, so here it goes. Uh, Vesuvius. Late one evening, Lewis McNeil's house converted itself into a hotel, as houses are wont to do. With the market in a slump, this was its best option. Lewis found out the next morning. He heard a knock on his bedroom door. Gloria, his wife, sat straight up and shook him awake. Who is it, she whispered flatly to him. I don't know, he said. Lewis quickly surveyed the room for a weapon of some kind and settled on a book with sharp metal corners before the knock came again. Housekeeping, 
The voice belonged to a woman. This is a private residence, Lewis said. I'm calling the police, Gloria shouted. But before she could pick up the phone, the knob turned and in walked a woman dressed in a blue frock. Through the door, Lewis could see the large cart piled high with towels and a line of turquoise cleaning products and bottles slung along the handrail. You want me comb back? The woman asked. How did you get in here? Lewis said. In a childlike show of fear, he threw the covers over his head. Lewis, Gloria said, be a man. But the woman did not address them. Housekeeping, she said again. She spoke aloud in a foreign language, Eastern European, maybe Romanian. He could not tell. She approached the bed and quickly tucked in the sheets so tightly that they could not move. Lewis's wife screamed, but then stopped when the woman folded down the flap of the sheet so that just her head showed. Housekeeping, the woman said again. Onto the bed, she placed a rectangle of paper with a circle cut out of one end. Hang on door if no disturb. She abruptly turned and walked out of the door, but came back inside and began to vacuum the room, picking up clothes where she found them and gently folding them over the back of the armchair. When she finished vacuuming, she brought three white towels that had been rolled up and set them on the bed by their feet. Lewis's wife had never stopped squirming or shouting, leave us alone, but it almost seemed to wrap them tighter into the bed. Finally, the woman gathered up the loose change. Just as Lewis was about to shout thief, she stacked the coins neatly on his nightstand in a glass ashtray and left the room, closing the door tightly until the latch clicked. Do you know that woman, Gloria asked. I've never seen her before in my life, Lewis said. I swear, did you hire a maid? No, she said. What is going on, he asked. Shh, Gloria said, listen. Lewis tilted his head toward the door, and under the low whirring of the furnace, he could hear the squeak of the wheels of the cart's wheel. She's still inside. Keep wiggling, Gloria said. No, buck your knees, Lewis insisted. Eventually, they settled on a system of both wiggling and bucking and freed themselves from the tyranny of the housekeeper's tucking. Lewis ran to the door to open it, but immediately stopped. There at his feet rested a crisp copy of a USA Today. What is it? She asked. The paper, he said. The dispatch? Corey asked. No, he said. The shitty one they give you in the hotels. It's today's date. He walked back inside. On his nightstand, the book he had grabbed to defend himself lay open. He read the page aloud to Gloria. It's a goddamn menu for room service, he said. He spent the next few moments swearing he would get to the bottom of whatever it was they were falling toward. While his wife calmly got dressed, and just before she put on her left earring and held the right one in her ear as she picked up the phone. Lewis went inside to the shower. Perhaps it was one of those dreams that accumulated atop one's scalp while sleeping. He scrubbed his head with fury until his head throbbed. When he returned, his wife had had no luck on the phone. When I told him there was a woman cleaning in my house, the dispatcher laughed and asked how much she charges for it, he said. Does it smell like smoke in here? Lewis asked. You don't smoke, she said. I used to, he said. I haven't in 30 years. I'd know that smell anywhere. Downstairs, the entire layout of the house had changed. A desk now stood near the front door, where once a nice coffee table had been. A sign over the desk read, Pompeii Inn. The desk had a bell on it, and a man behind it in a blue blazer uh, had a bell on it, and... Uh, a man behind it in a blue blazer stared intently into a computer. His blazer had a small breast patch embroidered with a volcano with little red and orange threads above its peak for lava. Good morning, the concierge said. Good morning, Lewis said. His wife hit him in the arm. Don't make small talk, Gloria said. Tell him to get out of our house. I'm afraid, the concierge said, you've missed breakfast. This is our house, Gloria said. Indeed, the concierge said, laughing. We all like to think of it as our house. In fact, that's our motto. He pointed to a motto in gold letters over the living room couch, where there used to be a picture of Lewis and his wife on vacation, posing in front of some Mayan ruins. No, this is my house, Lewis said. I pay mortgage on it every month. I have the papers. Sir, you are a crafty one in the morning, the concierge said, before returning to his computer screen. Lewis could feel the blood gather in his head. 
he wanted to walk up over to the man and throttle him when the phone rang, and the man held up his finger to Lewis and answered it. Lewis was so enraged that he barely noticed a portly man in a suit walked by with a cup of coffee in his hand. Hey, are you here for the convention? The portly man said. What? Lewis said. Because if you are, you better get a move on it, he said. The shuttle leaves in 15 minutes and someone still got wet hair. Listen, fat man, Lewis said. Just who the hell are you? I demand to speak to someone in charge. I demand to speak to someone in charge. Sir, the concierge said, cupping his hand to the receiver, please lower your voice and be mindful of the other guests. Other guests, Lewis said. Who else could be here? This is trespassing. Sir, please, the concierge said. He made a gesture with his hands like he was praying to an irresponsible god. Lewis sniffed. Why does it smell like smoke in here? Sir, the concierge said, I can assure you our rooms are smoke-free. Why is there an ashtray in, our, in my room then? We thought it a, th a quaint throwback, he said. I want you out, Lewis said. Check out as 11, sir, the concierge said. If there's anything I can do in the meantime, please don't hesitate. You go to hell, Lewis said. Lewis kept all of his important documents in an orange fireproof box hidden in a shoebox in the closet. But when the police finally arrived, his papers were matched with others from the concierge. Deed for deed, mortgage for mortgage, each man seemed to have a legitimate claim to the house, but the authority of business, the concierge's sharp tie, and the subtle air of masculinity wafting from his aftershave waved, weighed favorably against Lewis's pit-stained undershirt and his acrid morning breath. This is the Pompeian, the policeman said with a hand on his taser. You don't gotta like it, but that's the way it is. Check out is at 11, the concierge said again flatly unless you'd like to stay another night. I'd sooner set my hair on fire, Lewis said. Yes, Gloria said. What, Lewis said? We'll stay one more night, Gloria said. Sign here, the concierge said, handing them a bill. I suggest you pack tonight, the policeman said. He turned and began to walk out the front door when Lewis mumbled. What'd you say, the policeman said? Nothing, Lewis said. I said I need to buck up. I thought so, the policeman said. Gloria spent the entire morning and a good part of the afternoon calling friends from the neighborhood and leaving voicemail messages on local attorneys' phones. They had been married 30 years and the house was only half paid for, but still they had made their mark. Their friends expressed surprise and disappointment that they had been taken over, but what was one to do in the face of paperwork and legal documents? Had their identities been stolen, they knew it could take a long time to recover. It was best to get out while they could, Gloria reasoned. Lewis fumed as she spoke. He sat on the desk with his hand in the glass ashtray, furiously clinking it with his fingernail. Lewis and Gloria each had grown children from different marriages who stayed with them from time to time, but most of the pictures were of them alone in various remote locations, vacation photos taken during the same, year, same time every year. April, right after tax season, when Lewis's job relaxed and Gloria's patience for the gray days of Ohio finally reached their peak. She had been a kindergarten teacher and drew on her reserves of patience that such a job required. What do you want to do, Gloria said. I'm not leaving, Lewis said. I'm going to chain myself to this bed. You'll be arrested, she said. Let them come take me, he said. I don't care. The house is mine. I'd sooner burn it down than give it to them. Lewis shook his head and watched his wife fold clothes silently, placing neatly squared shirts and rolled socks into an overnight bag. What are you doing? He asked her. You heard the police. This is not our house anymore, she said. I'm getting ready to go. That's just like you, Lewis said. He knew fighting with her was just a substitution for fighting with the cops, so before it got ugly, he apologized. Then he went for a walk down the street. He had a drink at a strip mall, strip mall bar he never knew existed and so had never been inside. He could tell from the grime on the wood and the cheap stuffing leaking out of the bar's stool padding. It was not new. He drank and for a moment just wondered how his entire life he'd been ignoring places like this one. Even sitting there, he didn't know its name or where he was really. Not that such a place didn't exist geographically, but mentally. On the way back, he didn't recognize a single road sign or neighbor 
though he had no trouble finding his way back to the Pompeii Inn. That night, he and Gloria had dinner at the bar downstairs. He had to admit it was better than he could have made, a fish cutlet of some sort with pecans drenched in butter, tiny potatoes and carrots with the green still on them, the ones he could never find in a grocery store. The fat man passed again, and he managed to be humble when he apologized for the insult earlier. I don't know what came over me, Lewis said. He felt flushed from three glasses of wine, and as he stood to get up, he spilled his water glass. Instead of cleaning it, he watched the water gather atop the dry, clean red tablecloth and pool darkly before an ice cube, shiny and nearly black against the red below it, floated over the edge, and with it, the water cascaded down the side and onto the floor. Just leave it, Lewis said to Gloria. That last night, Lewis could not sleep. He'd eaten a red sauce for dinner, and now it was repeating on him when he leaned back. He thought of waking Gloria up and asking her to make love to him loudly like they had always done. But then he remembered that Gloria was mostly a quiet lover who in throes of passion wouldn't disturb a doe drinking from a brook. He grabbed the robe hanging on the back of the desk chair and put it on and then grabbed the ashtray and the book of matches. It was his other wife who was unabashed unabashed and afraid, unafraid of her passion. Once neighbors had called the police on them for fear and assault had been in progress. Another night during some dissociative moment, he nearly felt the same watching her jostle, jostle and push him around. She'd bit down on his earlobe with her canine and pierced it. He was a smoker then and now the memory left him walking with a fierce erection and a shudder and a desperate need for some human contact perhaps his own hand, but then he remembered the police officer, the joy it would have given him to answer a call for public exposure and find Lewis meekly tugging away at himself, lost in some corner like a vagabond pervert. Lewis roamed the hallways for a while until he came to the crawl space entrance at the end of the hall underneath an end table. He climbed up on the table and popped the lid where on the ledge of the opening, he had hidden a cache of cigarettes in a tin of mints. He looked at the blank book of matches, the cover embossed with that volcano in red, and lit one and touched a flame to the cigarette clenched in his teeth. He inhaled deeply and listened to the other tenants in what used to be his rooms, a spare bedroom for the kids, a home office with various unnecessary papers. Lewis looked around. He smoked and tapped the ashes into the glass tray in his hand. Every picture, the furniture, it had all been changed into a generic version of life. What upset Lewis most wasn't that the house had changed, but that it had changed, into, changed itself into such an average hotel. On his travels for business, he could always tell the quality of the hotel by the art on the walls. The poorer the quality, the more adventurous the landscape. Foaming sea cliffs, burnished gorges at sunset, pristine lakes sculpted into the bosom of snow-capped Alps. It was as if they had to choose art from a list of places their hotel could never possibly exist in. And now his home was one of them. He crouched down and touched a cigarette to the carpet and burned a hole. He felt the matches in his pocket. It would be so easy. The drapes in the hallway were sun-worn, a translucent polyester that would go up in a blaze to the wall across the ceiling. The attic might burn for an hour before the flames reached the floor. They could be long gone. He pulled the first match loose and flipped the cover against the head and pulled it with a pop. The small flame ignited. Then he heard her in the hallway. Lewis, she whispered. Yes, he said. He quickly tossed the match and dashed out the cigarette on the wall and stood in front of the black mark on the pane. I was worried, Gloria said. I'm right here, Lewis said. The fat man from before popped his head out the guest room door. Do you mind, he asked them, then slammed the door shut. Lewis mimed his sorrow and walked down the hallway toward Gloria. Some people, he said. Did I wake you? Who can sleep, she said. She sniffed and retied her robe. You smell funny. You smell it now, too, he asked. What were you doing out here, she asked. Nothing, he said. That ashtray, have you been smoking, she asked. I was returning it, he said. It's not mine. It's this place. It smells like a cheap motel. I guess it is, Gloria said. I guess it is, too. Lewis said.
They walked back to their room and locked the door. She sat on the edge of the bed with the light on. So where will we go, she asked. He pointed to one of the paintings on the wall. There, Lewis said. I don't know, Gloria said. Better than here, Lewis said. Kiss me. It's late, she said. I think we have to check out early. Kiss me anyway, Lewis said. And so she did. And he tasted like smoke, she knew. But then he whispered in her ear to make love to him like an alley cat, to claw his back and scream out his name in a demonic growl. What did they have to lose? To hold him with the passion a boxcar vagrant had for a tin of beans warmed on an open fire. And so she did, and so they did. They rattled the bed frame and the walls. They bounced on the springs as one beam, and the furnace blew hot on their skin and they were wet with sweat and making these suction noises almost like a pair of plungers. But then maybe at some point he thought it became more like waves rolling into some craggy inlet above some Italian vista he had never really seen in, or he had never seen in real life, only in a book. The one about those people turned to ash by the volcano, frozen in time by that hot cloud. I'm grunting like a boar, he shouted, to which Gloria replied, Careful, you might throw your back out. And she said it in such a loving way that he felt the surge of a lifetime of benevolence and human goodwill explode somewhere deep within him. Not in his loins where he expected, but in the back of his throat. And he realized he was sobbing for the love they had, for the life they had lived, for the vague life stretched out on the canvas above them. When he opened his eyes, he looked at her, found her figure in the wavering darkness. It smells like smoke, she said. The joke is, do you smoke after sex, Lewis said. You know, that's what they said to each other. Who? Who, she asked. The people in Pompeii, he said. After the volcano, what's its name? I can't remember its name. Oh, she said. She laughed and embraced him longer. Felt that exhaustion collapse and spread from him to her. I don't think it's important, she said. But Lewis was already sleeping. In an hour, Gloria awoke again. Sleeping next to Lewis was like sleeping next to a furnace. A thin flicker of orange under the door caught her eye, but Lewis snored on. His arm hung off the bed as if he were telling someone in the other room to stop. Had they left the hallway light on? No matter. There were no more electric bills to pay. In the morning, they would descend the stairs with all their goods and walk onward into the light without a reservation. But for now, she climbed back into bed and held him there and would do so until the heat of the day woke them, as if love was enough to keep them welded there to that spot forever. Good evening. I'm Steve Kistulins, the director of the graduate program at St. Leo University, and I thank you for joining us for our annual Wild Gifts reading of our creative writing faculty. My sincere hope is that the next time you see us, it will be face to face and we can celebrate our community and the great things that we do for the arts here at St. Leo. I'm going to read three poems from my forthcoming book, The Mating Calls of the Dead. It will be published in April by Black Lawrence Press. And the book takes as its premise, premise uh, a series of conversations between myself or a poet and people that are no longer in the poet's life. Uh, the first uh, that I'm going to read for you is the title poem from the book. It's called The Mating Calls of the Dead. And it's based on a story my father told me about his infantry service in World War II. The mating calls of the dead begin in Germany, the muddy slog of a wet and late spring, last days of the last just war. The iron men of the Mets, having stolen a town from the Germans by hiding in the woods, waited on the banks of the Saar River while nations melted around them. Engineers built pontoon bridges and sergeants waited to smoke. In those days, so much of the war was waiting, waiting and listening, the only sound, the crunch of the forest's undergrowth when the displaced persons began to emerge on the other bank. To be a displaced person means you are an upstanding citizen sandwiched between the chaos of advancing armies. 
To be a displaced person meant you were a peasant, another man whose family history is a history of terror, as peasant histories often are. Another word for peasant is victim. My father came from a long line of peasants and took his place alongside the other peasants of this man's army. You could identify the approaching peasants by their generous coating of soot and mud. The displaced, first one, then three, then five, carrying a pristine flag of surrender, a sheet somehow starched, blued, near spotless. There should be more to say here about the displaced persons, about the gauntness of their ribs, the one man with stomach distended enough to see the aorta's outline emerge, a blue afterimage in someone's sunken chest, the yellow eyes, the missing teeth, the ghost mouth, an opening in all that mud. I assume you have seen the photographs. It was a Tuesday. The displaced came out of the woods, Stalin's hellhounds nipping at their bloodied and shoeless heels, and one of them pointed to my father, asking, Are you one of us? Meaning, are you my people? Are you from the foothills of the Carpathian Mountains, the villages overrun at the beginning of eighth century's worth of European wars? Because if you are one of us, surely you must know our histories. This is the question that haunts, not knowing its meaning. Are you one of us men fleeing from the obvious terror? Are you one of us men sent on our usual urgent missions for help? Are you aware that what is left of the women has been left behind to watch what is left of the children? Are you aware there is almost no one left? Are you one of us, meaning are you haunted by what we hear? The murmurations of a thousand or so refugees, ten carts, as many horses, one mule, this is the tableau, my father, to his dying day, wondering aloud why they did not eat the horses. The army waiting for the end, a river, beyond a defeated army, and beyond them, a pillaging third force, pressing for Berlin. The displaced identify themselves with pride, son of Bolsheviks and Hussars and Cossacks all. My father offered the man coffee, water, a cigarette, all of which he took. There is never greed and desperation. This is what just war looked like. Refugees on all sides emerging from the burned out village, raising a flag of surrender once they exited the ghost wood. What did they hear? A chorus of whispers chasing them through these burned out fields, the looted mausoleum of Central Europe, the last 200 miles marching cadence to a chorus of voices, Slovak, Slav, and Pole, swelling and dirge-like a liturgic song. The church calls it a hymn, blessed memory, eternal memory. My father knew this plain chant for what it was, a song to learn and sing in all its tones, a summons to worship, the mating calls of all the dead. I'm going to read a poem called the final hours. Uh, I don't think you need to know much about it that isn't in the text. The final hours. Here, in a few hours, the last notes of Auld Lang Syne will come drifting through the neighbor's wall. Or maybe they will at midnight five years from now, when, like Christ in the desert, gone mad with fever, I will be given the gift of hindsight to see if your vision of a bleak and ruinous future or mine of a perfect one comes true. Who can tell? Maybe I know better, but I doubt it. Maybe I could convince you the future must always unravel in a clean and civilized way until it ends up exactly where it is supposed to, with you in my arms or not, as the kids say, achievement unlocked. Of all the things you should know, maybe near the top, is this. It has been years since I felt such a feverish dream, touched the want in a new pair of hands. So where does one find solace except vodka and books? Chekhov, in his famous story, writes about a man on vacation who spots a woman with a small dog, another tourist in unfamiliar land. To say what happens between them is predictable, denies the vagaries of the heart. He makes a fool of himself, as men and fools do in the cause of love, and then the story stops. 
but not in my version. A man chooses a door to open, then extends a hand and waits to see if the woman will join him on the other side. Last poem I'm going to read to you is about my friend Jay Bennett. Jay was the guitar player in the band Wilco. Um, passed away a few years ago. And uh, the first part of this poem is just some of my thinking about Jay, and it sprang off in another direction, which I suppose is a good thing sometimes. The poem's called A History of Brief Complications. A few years ago, the insomniac me watched a movie with the unironic title, I Am Trying to Break Your Heart. Those bold confessions always appeal to me, inclined as I am to ever more fanciful ways of thinking, as if I could be on every channel of your television. A friend of mine is actually in that movie, the last good thing he did before he died, and there is no romance in telling you his story. Other than sometimes I need to be scared all over again, so I might remember why it is I chose to live. My motives have always been this obvious. So much so, I wonder how well you've already seen through me, whether you know how I want to unzip myself, scare you off, make sure you see the ugliness first, so your decision can be as honest as I cannot. I told you I wanted to know everything, and I'm sure you know I meant it. I want you to unveil the truth to me, like the sacrament it is, or the commandments I think daily of breaking. Self-knowledge is a perpetual machine, powered in my case by loathing and doubt, but also certainty, the knowledge there could be something spectacular ahead. The only question is whether it is a car crash or a sunset or a desiccated memory, a pressed flower abandoned in a favorite book, an artifact that helps explain why you knew this was such a bad idea and craved it anyway. I thank you for listening, and I hope to see you soon. everybody. Thank you so much for being here. And a special thank you to Megan Case for uh, making all of this possible. So I'm going to read a few poems for you tonight. Uh, a couple of them are older poems from my book that came out last year called One House Down. And then I have a couple of newer poems for you too. Well, we've been spending a lot of time at home, all of us. So I wanted to read uh, the opening poem about it's going to be about my house. It's called The House Called Shadow Garden, and uh, you'll hear that it's sort of two different perspectives of the house. The first one is Day Inside. This crone of a house, her cold creakiness and wind sighs, the couch unsettles the bed. Morning's luck rearranges your pillow. Maybe old sorrows, maybe bad pipes, clumsy ghosts, knocking around the front room. Once the ghost whispered into my hair, wanted back the house. Closet doors clattered. I threw down my dust rags, claimed every wall mine. All afternoon, a gauzy cloud, moss in a wet window. Then the little porch light came on. Later, your hands turned over the pillows looking for the cool side. Night, outside. This crone of a house, her wind sighs and cold creakiness. Searchlights splinter the oaks. Night's copters shave the roof. Maybe fireworks, maybe gunshots. 15th Street cars riding high on roulette wheels. The bass thumping. Windows nervous as soft teeth. Bad, staggering sleep. I thump the hot pillow, looking for the cool side. All dark long, distant barks, the greening orange trees. Then morning sprinklers kiss the heat. Angel trumpet croons to walking iris. What a pretty face you've put on. So that's my house, Shadow Garden, which is in Seminole Heights. The house is going to be 100 years old uh, in seven years. 
and we've lived here for 25 years. Okay, um, <clears throat> this time of year always makes me think about my parents. They're both de deceased. Uh, the anniversary of my father's passing was September 30th, and then my mother's birthday is November 5th. So I want to read this poem um, also just because uh, it mentions my mom's piano. And this is a piano that I took lessons on, and I, you know, I learned how to play uh, mediocrely <laughs> as, a, as a teenager. Uh, but my mother's piano, which was a Goldbranson piano, after they both passed away, we donated the piano to the St. Leo Music Department as a practice piano. So sometimes I can go down into the basement um, of the music uh, wing there and visit the piano. <laughs> and um, it, this is called Reverend Billy's Boogie Woogie and Mom's Goldbranson. Now, Reverend Billy is a very well-known sort of rock and roll um, hipster musician, sort of in the, uh, in the same line as, um, as um, oh, his name just escaped me. But anyway, you'll hear about him in the poem. So this is Reverend Billy's Boogie Woogie and Mom Skull Branson, and it's set at the Palladium Theater in St. Petersburg, Florida. We're here for the hillbilly death match. Two balladeers duking it out. Heartbreak versus Boogie Woogie. Les Paul guitar versus Steinway Baby Grand. The Friday Night Music Palace seeps age and glory. Rows of faded velvet seats, wooden backs worn smooth from decades of sweat and delight. The balladeers got the guitar. His finger work is a cheery stroll. His second tenor muttered lyrics, walking us around the yard, down the block, to the intersection of heartbreak and wanting more. We're referees. Our seat shifting and half yawns call it, no way is this round going to him. Then, Reverend Billy stomps onto the stage in a cowboy zoot suit and kick-ass boots. He pounces on the ivories, his hands the tarantella, the electric slide, the St. Vitus dance of Boogie Woogie. We hoot and jive in our seats. It's a musical K.O. God, it feels good to get shaken this way after months of putting the house to sleep, forcing a coma on one room at a time. Rev says he wants to slow it down, play something pretty, melodic, and melancholy, it takes me back to my mother's back room where her old upright gold Branson sags, unsold, untuned. She filled the house with show tunes and old standards, South Pacific, Annie Get Your Gun, her low alto tremolo. It's been mute for years. Rev caresses the Steinway. Behind him, the velvet curtains are crenellated, ballooned. Above him, the stage lights are blue as my mother's eyes. Okay, um, now I want to read another poem. And this poem is set at the National Cemetery that's here in uh, Central Florida in Bushnell, not too far from St. Leo. Um, this poem came out in what was called the Orange Blossom Review, uh, edited by uh, some of my colleagues here at St. Leo. And um, I guess all I'll say about it is that the last line of it is adapted from a line uh, by Pablo Neruda. So at the National Cemetery. A doe is still among the death cradles in dappling shyness, her fawn waits in the brush. If a little rain steeples its fingers, if dusk approaches and flanks us from the east, maybe the longleaf pines will indulge their green sorrows. All the rows are white and orderly as the alphabet, the service road blurry with dust. Oh, my parents, oh, two-faced death, 
wind from the tombs carries off, scatters your sleeping roots. Okay, now I want to shift gears and I want to read a couple of poems that are, are newer that I've written during the pandemic. And the first one is an ode to supermoons. Um, if you think back to the beginning of the year, you know, here we are, we're in lockdown, we're seeing numbers rise, uh, cases of, of the virus, people are passing away. But in the midst of all this, starting in February, we have four months in a row where we have supermoons, and it's just an incredible thing to be happening simultaneously with everything else. So I had to write about it. And this poem has a little epigraph uh, by Deborah King. The energy of the moonlight holds its own special power. So this is Ode to Supermoons During a Plague. In any given year, there could be at least three of you. But in this, the year of our plague, you converged on us in an orderly quartet. February, March, April, May. Four spectacles in Farmer's Almanac names. Oh, hunger moon, worm moon, pink moon, flower moon, you peaked like this awful plague is peaking, still there, still there, one night to the next. Your Algonquin names call out the pink flocks, hunger and bone, crow and sap, egg and sugar, planted corn, sprouted grass. Your names mean fertility in the midst of this death. Silver, yellow, snow white or blonde, you are flying in your perigee. You are lounging in elliptical longitude. You are opposite our sun exactly 180 degrees. I stand in my spangled solitary yard enrobed in your glinting energy. It's after midnight. The whole world is unlit. O oh, flower moon, milk moon, mother moon, you're the last super moon in a trembling year. Okay, and the last poem is uh, called Miriam Webster Explains the Meaning of My Isolation. And I had so much fun working on this poem. Uh, what I wanted to do was work in as many synonyms and maybe antonyms of the word isolation as I could. So I did a lot of research and I also researched the origin of the word and looked up ways that it could be used and, um, you know, part of the part of speech and all of that. And I tried to work some of that in. I would say I worked in only about 5% of what I looked up, but it's there anyway. So this starts with a direct quote from the, the dictionary from Merriam-Webster and you'll hear how it plays out. Merriam-Webster explains the meaning of my isolation. After the long book tour, the author looked forward to the isolation of his office, is the first example of how isolation is used in a sentence. Then synonyms and antonyms. But I am not a he, and the book tour was canceled. Instead, I'm staying at home, sequestered, it is not like exile, Napoleon, or Neruda. In some ways, it feels like withdrawal. And this poem is in quarantine. Potholders scrunch into my seclusion. Now I've become an eating machine. I can't stop gnawing at solitude. I want to zoom out of this confinement like a woman giving birth. I want to knock elbows and bump knuckles so as not to feel utterly alone. There are fitted sheets to tuck into my aloofness. There are supermoons to fill the vacuum. I say, drink, bring me drink. Loneliness is the worm. Okay, everybody, thanks so much for watching. Stay safe, take care, be kind.